So, hey everybody, I'm Jay. Howdy, I'm Vic. And we are here to, no, I'm kidding. Um, so basically, Google Cloud for the enterprise. Um, the title of the session, probably no big surprise. Um, Google's cloud isn't necessarily always at the top of everybody's mind, right? There's a couple other providers you might be a little more familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis. They shall uh, not be named. Yes, which shall not be named. <laughs> but don't confuse maybe lack of marketing uh, with lack of product. So that's what we're here to do today. Uh, since we only have 30 minutes, uh, what I want to do is split it into about 10, 15 minutes of telling you a little bit about what we've been doing beyond just compute network storage and kind of the tech bits you're used to. And I'm going to turn it over to the lovely Vic to show you a demo uh, that actually shows some of these kind of cooler networking features, some of the enterprise-y things folks are looking for on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So. Where I want to start, like I said, I'm going to go through these kind of quickly, just because I don't want to put anybody to sleep. Um, but those that might be familiar with Google over the years, are one of our big mission statements is that we like to focus on the user, and all else will follow. So folks such as myself, I'm a 20-year enterprise guy, uh, lots of J2E. Any boos in the audience back in the early <laughs> 2000s? Spring was a savior of mine. Uh, you know, a lot of the big J2E platforms. Um, so there's folks like myself that have joined Google and we're starting to evangelize a bit more about how to use Google's cloud. So we're focusing more now on the enterprise user and all else will follow. And so it's from a couple different, I'm, I'm a big fan of the power of three. So there's kind of three areas that we're looking at this. One is just from a core platform differentiation perspective. So this is literally the bits and the bytes, right? How is our compute able to support you? How is our networking? How is our storage? How are we built? to be able to support enterprise workloads today. The second piece, and this is something that a lot of large customers are looking to us for, is the innovation. So okay, fine, this is what we do today, but who can we partner with three years from now, five years from now, that's gonna help us innovate as we go? You know, a lot of folks don't necessarily uh, have a problem with Google as an innovator, so how are we now bringing that into the enterprise? And then finally, from a sheer partnership perspective, so once again, not just building consumer products, but how do we work with all of you and identify how we can bring new features and functions into the platform, once again, for your workloads today and tomorrow. So we're gonna dial into these a little bit, uh, one at a time. So over the past year or so, and actually this is dated a bit, we've rolled out uh, over 300 features on top of the platform. And many of these have been focused on enterprise needs. So from a networking perspective, things like VPN, subnetworks, something we call Google Cloud Router. We just released an internal load balancer a few weeks ago. So folks that maybe looked at us a year ago, and you hear that sometimes, oh, they're not ready for the enterprise, they're not ready for the enterprise. We innovate quickly. So did anybody get a chance to check us out in the, uh, anybody do the Google Code Labs? by chance in here? It's a couple hands. So if you get a chance, stop out at our booth, because we're actually doing code labs. You can try some of this stuff out for yourself. And you can get a Raspberry Pi if you complete four of the code labs. So that's a very cool feature of our code lab. Exactly. <laughs> you can win uh, Raspberry Pis, Chromecast. We're doing big drawings every day for a Chromebook. So you actually get something at the end. And this is all on top of the fact that you know, people think we've only been doing this for two or three years. We've been doing this for 15 years. We just haven't been selling it. So the last three years has been externalizing these cloud services, externalizing the platform, and actually being able to let other people now consume our services. What a lot of folks don't always think about, you know, you probably know a lot of these pro uh, products that I have up on the screen. Seven of these products have over a billion active users apiece, a billion each. So think about the infrastructure to power that. Think about like the server logs for Gmail, right? These are problems we had to solve. And so those data technologies, that's what we're turning outward. And by the way, sneak peek, those are also the data technologies that we're starting to plumb up through Cloud Foundry. So any Pivotal Cloud Foundry users out here, we're bringing that to the Cloud Foundry platform. So you can ingest and use those services directly to your Cloud Foundry developers by the end of the year. So once again, if you stop by our booth, we actually have a lot of demos to try out, and you can see what some of these data services look like, and know that they're gonna be available for you there. 
Couple other kind of interesting tidbits. Um, for example, we have our own fiber, thousands of miles of fiber that wraps the planet. If we were a telco, we'd be the second largest telco on the planet. We're the only cloud provider that does this like this. So for example, when you look at all of our edge locations, why this matters, particularly if you have a lot of large scale traffic, all of these edge locations, if there's a request that is destined for a Google resource and it hits one of these pops, we identify it, we suck that request in, it rides our backbone the rest of the way to the target. And after processing, we take the response and we send it back in the most optimized path. So once again, differentiation on our platform from where we've been for the past 15 years. My, de my demo will be showing kind of how you can tie these things together, a use case using Pivotal Cloud Foundry in order to leverage this network, which is really cool. Yeah, it's an, and that's the global load balancer piece. I'll let him speak more to during the demo, but hopefully you guys see, will see how this is starting to tie together. Now, from a pure innovation perspective, I mentioned before, you know, between 25 and 30 services now are what are on our platform. And we do compute, we do network, we do storage, all the things you're used to. We do it very well. Great price performance ratio, love to talk to you about it. But where the really innovative pieces are tomorrow in the next few years is around data. Data is like the new cloud to me. Like, you know, five, six years ago, people would talk about cloud and nobody wanted to talk about cloud. Now it's data is eating the world, data, data, data. But just like cloud became incredibly real, data is very real to folks. We talk to people that are already speaking of an exabyte that they know they have to plan for in the next three to five years. And how do you build out the physical infrastructure and the storage to handle that? And that's where, once again, we've done it. Who here knew or knows that Google keeps a complete copy of the internet on their storage? Couple? You cheater. Who, who here knew that we actually keep two copies of the internet on our storage? So once again, stop it, once again, <laughs> That's the scale that we're used to dealing with, and that's what we're trying to expose. So once again, we have it at the, uh, at the pure infrastructure level, we have it at the data level, and we have it at the application developer level. Once again, the engineering efforts we have going on with Pivotal, where our engineers and Pivotal engineers building a best of breed stack of Pivotal Cloud Foundry on Google Cloud Platform with our data services plumbed in. Very cool stuff. So a couple of ones I wanted to point out before I turn it over to Vic, because once again, I know we only have 30 minutes. Um, Google Cloud Data Proc. This is one of the data services that I think is very differentiated. Hadoop users or coders or consumers. Hadoop, anybody? I know some of you use Hadoop. I, used to know. <laughs> um, I know, I see you. Uh, <laughs> basically, our data proc service is a fully managed, no ops Hadoop. You do nothing. You specify your cluster up to 11,000 cores spun up in 90 seconds. You run your job. When the job is done, blow the cluster away. You only pay by the minute for how long that job ran. You point to the data. You specify the jar file. Give it the, actual, the main class. Specify your arguments. Done. Another one, Google BigQuery. This is probably, uh, I would say, our our current most popular That's right. data platform. So I hate to call it an EDW, like a traditional enterprise data warehouse, because it kind of dumbs it down. But this is literally petabyte scale. We have a customer that stores 40 petabytes in our BigQuery platform. And they ingest 2 million rows a second into BigQuery. You pay 2 cents per gig per month for storage, and you pay by the query. No licenses. You don't have to buy anything up front. You don't have to prepay for anything. Multi terabyte queries in 10 to 15 seconds. So, just once again, crazy scale. This is based on Dremel, if anybody's familiar with the white paper on Dremel. And that was to query all those uh, Gmail logs I was talking about a few minutes ago. This is where we've come from. We've had to solve Google problems. There were no products available to do this stuff. But now, once again, in 2016, we're externalizing all of those services. And that's where things like BigQuery come into play. Very, very cool stuff. And then TensorFlow. Anybody here familiar or heard of TensorFlow at least? Cool. So as this, this slide at least says, the number one repository for machine learning. 
But once again, this is for both training your models and for running your models. And our hosted version of this, which is going to be our cloud machine learning, we already have five different pre-trained models that you can literally access just via API right now. You can log into cloud.google.com. You can use our vision API, which those of you that use Google Photos might know you can type in cat and it'll show you all the pictures of your cat, right? Or somebody else's cat for that matter, if you have that for some reason. But also the speech API, so literally audio uh, speech to text, the natural language API. And you can train your own models as well. So you can run TensorFlow in your private data center or run cloud machine learning on our cloud. From the partner perspective, so you know, there was a lot of noise last year whenever Diane Green joined. Um, and I actually spent four years at VMware, so I'm very familiar with Diane's history there. And the one thing I always like to point out, because you know, people just say enterprise, 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 but specifically with Diane, you know, we had this amazing piece of technology, vSphere, right? And what it did was completely abstract the underlying physical infrastructure. So you were relying on that little piece of software, especially today, for your most mission-critical applications. What Diane operationalized at VMware was kind of understanding with large enterprise customers what was critical, what were the checkboxes, what were the things that you know, we had to do at VMware to be a trusted product for that kind of thing, to let you trust VMware and vSphere for those workloads. And that's exactly what she's doing now on GCP. So once again, we're known for innovation. We build great products. But that process of actually interacting with the customers, understanding what those needs are, all those networking things I mentioned, those weren't there a year ago. And that's why I told you before, if you tried us out a year ago, you might not think that we do networks and you know, private and public and all those kinds of things. They're all there now. Now, do we have everything? I'm sure if we pulled everybody in this room, we could find plenty of things that we're still working on, right? But that's the process, and that's the mind shift, and that's the change that we were doing to be more of an enterprise-focused cloud. And philosophically, one last thing before I turn it over to Vic. So open APIs and open source, this is absolutely central to what we're doing. So open source sometimes is just kind of a fun way for some people to think things are free. Right? But the commitment to open source and the commitment to those communities is how you know how you have a trusted vendor in this space. And so when I mentioned before about TensorFlow, here's an example of something we could have built, sold it as a service, and because nobody else does it like us, just expect that we'll you know, be able to sell lots of it. But we didn't. We open sourced the TensorFlow piece. If you want to run it in your data center, if other vendors come along and build packaged products off of it, they can. We're probably going to run it better. <laughs> but the moral of the story is we're putting the focus forth to make sure you don't have the lock-in that you have, and that's part of what open source uh, actually provides, right? The other example I'll give real quick is Bigtable. So some of you might know Bigtable is what we use to index Google. Our index is 50 petabytes. We externalized that last year as a service, so you can now go consume Bigtable as a service yourself. When we did that, we didn't turn out our internals. We said, wait a minute, there's this whole bustling community around HBase, and we actually used the HBase API in front of our Bigtable service. So those are a couple of examples. There's a lot more. Obviously, we're here at Spring 1, and Fix Demo is around the Spring Boot app. Cloud Foundry, I mentioned about PCF, and we're going to be at CF Summit. So we're supporting the Cloud Foundry Foundation and all of the Cloud Foundry work. So once again, it's something we have actual engineering bodies and significant focus on in all product strategies. If it already exists, we will use that API. If we think we're breaking new ground, we will open source whatever we did. So especially for this kind of a conference, and once again, I've been a a big spring person myself since 2004 when I shot 480 EJBs in the head, long story. Um, I thought that might be something this community would appreciate as well. So that being the case, to tee up Vic, networking tends to be one of the biggest things that enterprises want to understand what my cloud provider is doing and can do for me. So there's basically four pillars here, okay? 
There's the virtual network space, which means how we carve up our networks. So we have our own SDN, which we've been doing since 2007, before SDN was cool. We have global networks out of the box, but then you can actually carve them down into subnetworks. From a control perspective, IAM. Once again, a year ago, you wouldn't have seen IAM on Google. Who here cares about IAM? You don't really have to raise your hand, but thank you if some of you did. Um, everybody cares about IAM, right? Yes. Firewalls, once again, internal load balancers. From a global scale, that's probably kind of obvious. But what are those controls? What can I do at global scale? What protocols can I use at global scale? What about DNS at global scale? And then finally, hybrid. This, this actually, this subject, because of my time at VMware, is very near and dear to me. So feel free to grab me after this session or at the booth or you see me on the floor. I love talking about all this stuff. But you know, hybrid is definitely one of the ones that gets very crazy very quick. But in teeing this up, I'm going to turn over to Vic, who's going to actually show you something cool. I figured you'd rather see him do stuff than me. So thanks, thanks for being patient. I can definitely vouch Jay loves to talk. So <laughs> fire away. When very you nice. Um, so I'm going to show a demo today of a global Cloud Foundry deployment. So how many people have deployed Cloud Foundry before? Yes, lots of you. And you use Bosch? Yes, that's magical piece of software right there. Um, so what I'm going to show is basically tying multiple regions of Cloud Foundry together using our global HTTP load balancer. So the way this works is you get one uh, Anycast IP that you can use to route requests globally. So what we have is a global domain, app.gcp.solutions. And then that routes traffic to two deployments of Cloud Foundry, one in US Central and one in US East. Those also have their own wildcard domains in case maybe you wanted to deploy something only to Central or only to East. But if you wanted to make something global, you could deploy it uh, at the app.gcp.solutions um, tier. Um, so what the HTTP load balancer does is basically uh, recognizes where a request is coming from and then is able to route it to the closest region. So if you had you know, n regions, you would always get uh, responses from the closest region. But you don't have to do any crazy DNS tricks to get the request to the right place, which is really awesome. Um, I have not so crazy DNS tricks that I'll show you now. Um, so uh, I have this all on GitHub. Uh, the, the link is there. If you have any questions, I'm Vic Nasty on Twitter and Vglacius at Google. Um, and I'll be around just like Jay if I can get him to stop talking. All right, so uh, let, let's check out how this is set up. So basically the first thing I have, uh, I have a domain with uh, Google domains, and uh, that's the gcp.solutions domain, and I'm ha I have an A record that's doing the wildcard for the app domain to the single IP that is my global HTTP load balancer. Then from there, I'm <laughs> delegating the subdomain uh, .cf to uh, the cl Google Cloud DNS. When the Bosch deployments launch, they actually register themselves uh, with a DNS name uh, for like app, uh, sorry, API dot and login dot uh, to, to that domain. So all the requests can get there properly. So what does that look like? Let's go ahead and connect to a few regions here. So I have three VMs in three different regions and I'm gonna show them uh, getting to the right place, uh, quote unquote. So uh, here is the, the visualization of what you see when you uh, have an HTTP load balancer. And here you can see that I have requests coming in uh, from North America, and there's some uh, a thousand dish going to US Central. I have about 100 going to US East. Uh, and then my European traffic is going to US East because that's the closest um, uh, Cloud Foundry deployment to them. Um, in Cloud DNS, I can show the configuration here. So I have a delegated zone, .cf, and I have uh, two wildcard domains that are pointing to the uh, L3 load balancers for each of the, the Cloud Foundry regions. So I have uh, star.central.cf.gcp.solutions and star.east.cf.gcp.solutions, and those are each going to their respective uh, Cloud Foundry deployments. So you'll see over here, I have quite a bit of Cloud Foundry deployed. Um, you'll see all these beautiful cores being used uh, for my application. And I have uh, one uh, Bosch director per region. And then I also deployed one in Europe so that I could send requests from over there. So uh, the application that I have is, uh, you guys are going to love my ability to create 
Spring applications here. This is the actual hello world from the getting started uh, with Spring. That was my first uh, initiation into it. Uh, I basically have an environment variable uh, in there that says which region uh, each of the, the apps is deployed to. And now let's go check out what it would look like, uh, for example, from US East. So if I curl, uh, my app is called hello. If I curl that, my request coming, uh, being sent from US East is being received by the US East deployment. Similarly, uh, if I go to Europe, oops, and I curl the same thing. Uh, sorry, hello.app.gcp.solutions. I, again, am coming from US East. And if my traffic was coming from US Central, if I can find that region, My traffic is being routed to uh, the proper region here as well. And now, just to, while he's doing this, oh. so one, one of the things I didn't mention before, so I, I talked about being part of VMware. So I was part of the Cloud Foundry Spring team that spun out the Pivotal in 2013. So folks in the audience using Cloud Foundry doing multi-region load balancing to CF. This is kind of cool, right? And with, in general, with Google's load balancer, just to give you an idea, so when I talked about the work that we're doing, and actually I'm gonna embarrass Eric Johnson, he's in the second row there, and he's not even gonna look, he's gonna pretend I'm not pointing at him. He's in a blue shirt on the far right-hand side. <laughs> that guy, get smiling him. Smiling a lot. <laughs> him and his engineering team has actually done wonders with the Pivotal engineering team. And so things like the load balancer out of the box, when you deploy it on GCP, you're using the same load balancer that YouTube and maps and search uses. So once again, when I'm talking about enterprise and the ability to handle load, going from zero to a million QPS in under a second. You don't have to warm anything, you don't have to configure anything, it's just magic-ish, yeah, you know. So I just want to point that out while you were doing what you were doing, because it's something I want to make sure when you're watching what he's doing here contextually, it comes across. So I also wanted to show kind of the, the configuration of that HTTP load balancer. It's definitely one of my favorite features I've ever gotten to use, this like global notion, and really it brings that tech magic back to me for some reason. Uh, I just can't even believe that it's actually doing what it's doing. Um, the way you configure it is basically to have uh, several backends. Uh, so each HTTP load balancer can uh, uh, route requests to several backends. Uh, you could have requests routed based on the host or uh, a URL path or anything like that. I just uh, forward everything to these two backends. And you can say how much uh, capacity each backend can have. So you can also spill over traffic Let's say that US Central is busy. Uh, it can only handle 10,000 requests per second or something like that. It'll spill over requests into the other regions that have capacity available. You may have a little uh, higher latency, but you're still getting those requests to a backend that's gonna be healthier. Um, so that's a really cool uh, feature there. Uh, the other thing that's, that's really cool is with the uh, HTTP load balancer, to get the, the CDN enabled, it's one check mark and then it's on, and then you don't have to worry about CDN anymore, um, which is really cool. So here, uh, the other things you could do, again, are the host path rules, so which uh, host and path goes to which backend, so you can kind of uh, multiplex here. Uh, and then there's also front-end configuration where you could have multiple IPs, different certificates, you can use SSL, all that kind of cool stuff, uh, and it's really easy to conceptualize, I think, uh, especially with this UI, um, so I hope that you guys try it out. It's one of my favorite features. Awesome, Vic, cool. thank you. Yeah. Cool stuff, right? I mean, it's, I think, like I said before, folks that have, are, are familiar with kind of the multi-region CF, that's been kind of a requested feature for a long time. I think a lot of the things that we're doing here, hopefully, you find is cool. Um, if I bounce back to... Oh, slides, slides. Yeah. Right. oh, there. So one thing I did want to do, even though we were down to only 30 minutes, and I think we have about six minutes left, I did want to pimp out two more sessions. <laughs> One, Eric, who I embarrassed a minute ago, everybody look at Eric. He's <laughs> going to be doing a session with a good friend that I won't embarrass uh, tomorrow, uh, <laughs> our friends at Home Depot. It's actually, it's, we're calling it in the workshop because the intention is to show you all the nice blood and guts of what went into some earlier stage work. So it'll be kind of fun to see what they're doing, some code that's going to be shared, so on and so forth, so please come to that. 
Um, actually, I forgot to delete that second line because unfortunately Jesse was not able to make it. So ignore that second line. Uh, but we'll actually be, check, make sure you check out the Home Depot session tomorrow. So with five minutes left, would love to open it up for Q&A. Hard stuff for Vic, softballs for me. Any questions anybody want to shout out? Or do you want five minutes left? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, so question was, can you do the load balancing for also private IP space, I'm assuming? So currently the internal load balancer is only TCP, um, but we haven't heard too much request for that kind of functionality. And I mean, the, the globalness of the HTTP load balancer is kind of the big feature. Um, so we don't have that quite baked yet, but you know, something we could totally add. Um, the global pair is right? Yes, yeah, so you get one IP that uses any cast uh, and then it routes to the right place and it goes to the most local pop uh, point of presence that Google has, which you saw the 100 that we have uh, across the globe. And then from there on Google Backbone to the region that you want to get to. Sorry, I don't understand the question. So, so uh, you, you cast mm -hmm. local. Yeah. I think it's per subnet, which are scoped to the region. So we don't yet have the WAN replication. We only have multi-zone. Um, so you'd have to have uh, your, your data zonal, um, but cross-zone replicated. But the one thing I'll point out there is, and we've seen this multiple times, so I mentioned before about our fiber and about the ability right. to actually push bits very quickly. What we have seen is, even though it's not automagical yet in some services, like Bigtable, for example, some of those are going to come a little bit sooner than others. Even for ones where you do have to set up the replication, being on our wire from region to region and yeah. zone to zone, now, we've heard very, very good results from a latency perspective. Yeah. But a lot of it is coming. That's right. You could, if that's, if that's what you wanted to do, yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. Someone's looking at their watch, so we might have time for one or two more questions. Uh-oh, back over in the corner. <laughs> A host name. You do have to bind it to a shared domain, um, at least in this this way that it's configured. I don't have the depth of knowledge on Bosch configurations yet uh, to be able to do anything different, but I'm sure there are people in the room that can help me with my Bosch config. It's up on GitHub, so please make it better. Um, the way I was doing it was all with uh, host-based routing. Well, the other thing I was going to say too, I was you know shooting my mouth off before about being more enterprisey and working with customers. So if you want, whether it's after this session or once again find me at the booth, we can sit down and talk about what the use case is. Because yep. uh, to Vic's point, you know, a very wise person a long time ago pointed out to me the first part of the word customer is custom. Yep. So every single one, every, everyone's different. So please grab one of us. We'd love to talk through it and make sure that if it's not there today, what can we maybe be doing to solve the problem moving forward? So I, I'm, I think I'm literally getting hooked. Anybody else with another question? We'll wrap up. Please grab us. That's why we're here. We got 20 Googlers descending on Vegas this week to give you all a big hug. So uh, please grab any one of us at any point in time. Thanks so much for coming out. Appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.